Welcome, everyone. Good morning, London. And thank you, John, for that rousing introduction, I assume, since I'm talking to nobody. I realize none of you have seen me in quite a while. Do you get it? I'm freaking invisible and you haven't seen me in a while. Honestly, I don't know how long to pause for laughter here when I'm talking to a green light on my iMac. Admittedly, worrying about how long to pause for laughter is probably in the category of Yagni or you ain't gonna need it. So I do hope you will have patience with uh, my complete inexperience with this sort of thing. I always thought maybe one day I would make screencasts or video podcasts or whatever the kids call them these days. But since I've never actually gotten around to it, this is effectively my inaugural such thing. I'm sure you're all pleased to observe that I did realize that being invisible the entire time would uh, be more than annoying. Uh, in my day, all we had was Starwipe, and we got a lot of mileage out of Starwipe, and it was never too much. But I have a feeling that some of the tricks they have these days, at which I was like, whoa, uh, are too much. So mostly I'll be here, but I can't promise I won't do something else. I should also note that I thought that screencasting software would be a piece of cake, uh, and I even purchased Camtasia for that purpose, but uh, it turns out that all my hardware is too old, all my software is too new, and all software sucks. Uh, so in the end, I have here some weird combination of using Photo Booth, QuickTime, uh, Keynote, uh, FFmpeg, and God knows what else. Uh, but in any case, let's proceed. I'm terribly sorry that I am not there in the flesh. I intended to be. Circumstances have conspired to keep me in Oregon and not in London. So I'm literally phoning it in, but I have done my best not to phone it in. The fact is, I had some demands that seemed perfectly reasonable to me, but that for whatever reason, uh, they would not or could not accommodate. Um, I found out later that there was a camera on us as I was issuing some of these demands, and uh, I will leave you to judge whether I was being as reasonable as I'm certain that I was. Do you have those spotlights that come up from the ground so that it casts my shadow behind me like a giant looking over his own shoulder? In all honesty, this just seems like the minimum one should expect in a speaking engagement, but I don't know. The world has gone mad. So, in an effort to psych myself up for this talk, I obtained some pictures of the room that I believe you to be in. If this is grossly misrepresentative of where you are presently sitting, then all of this is for naught, but in the belief that it is, I started with this one, but this feels far too much like uh, every lecture I went to in college in that my view is from the very back row and I can slip out 10 minutes into the lecture uh, because I'm completely bored and that won't work here. So I looked around for a better perspective on the matter, something more inspiring, and I found this much more on point and this is good. This is about where I would be standing, I guess, if I were there and not here. Uh, but still, I'm speaking to a bunch of empty chairs, uh, Clint Eastwood style, and that's not really very inspiring either. I need the feedback I get from actual faces so that I know what's working and what isn't. Um, well, it turns out that over the last few years, while I haven't been working on the Scala compiler, I've been a, becoming a master of illusion. And you will now see the fruits of those efforts. That's right. From an empty room to one populated by 
Well, these are the speakers uh, at, uh, according to the website, um, more than once in some cases. Uh, but wow, it's like a full room and suddenly I have the crowd energy infusing me and it's great. And uh, so mission accomplished. Uh, it's, it's as if I were there. Um, the illusion is complete. And I'm sure nobody will speak against this because I'm the only one with a mic. Okay, let's talk a little bit about DF. Now, this is the output of DF with no options on my machine. Um, it's hard to know what to say about this other than this is the worst thing I've ever seen. I, and I know perfectly well that many of you hearing me talk about this right now could give me lots of reasons why it has to be this terrible uh, or why it is this terrible or how it's actually serving some wonderful purpose to be this terrible. But all I know is that this is the most useless output of a two-letter command that a person could possibly imagine. What are the circumstances under which I want to see the value of max long minus some trivial amount written several times on my screen? Uh, imagine if we had two to the 256 I notes that we use nine of rather than only two to the 63 or 64. It's nuts. Uh, that's just the beginning, of course, because DF after it started being expanded to show you things that aren't disks, they had to figure out what to put in the capacity column. So they very sensibly decided that if capacity doesn't make any sense for a particular thing, that they would just put 100% there so that it could always look like disk is running out all over the place and you have to look past all those 100% on things where it means nothing uh, where, and if it says 100% on an actual disk, well, that's up to you to discover. Uh, we're not going to help you at all. And if we look harder and see all the bizarre sort of ephemeral mounts that are turning up here that have these long, meaningless paths that only exist because the backup is running right now and it won't be there again in a minute, Clearly, this is useless, and yet it eats up a two-letter spot uh, in, like, that's the primest of prime real estate in the command line, and it's much worse than just taking DF away from me. DF, I could live without, maybe. But tab completion is deeply affected by what's on the path. So if I say D tab, there's no chance of me fast forwarding to anything good because uh, I got to get past DF and maybe that's what I meant. So, oh, okay, we're gonna have to give it at least the second letter every time. In other words, every single thing on the path has an effect on the utility of tab completion. And we're so uh, used to, to by Stockholm syndrome here to having so much garbage on our paths that nobody actually expects to get more than a tiny uh, jump forward in there tab completion, but let me tell you, as somebody who tried subtracting everything from their path and adding programs back in one at a time, uh, I found that you only need like a hundred and it's amazing. And they can even have long explanatory names if you want, because there's so little on your path that it only takes a couple keystrokes to get there. Wow. Uh, this is, doesn't have to be a fantasy world. This could actually be the world. Here's the first thing somebody would say, well, use D the dash H option to DF so that you get quote unquote human readable uh, numbers. And indeed this is slightly better. We still have all the same garbage lines, but at least the amount of disk space being uh, used available in the total are written uh, with the crazy uh, units that turned up after we had kilobytes, we got kibibytes or whatever the heck they're called. Um, so that's something. Notice, however, that, of course, that the inode counts, which is just as useless as useless could be, are still there written out in all their glory. I, you know, they, I'm sorry that they didn't do it in octal or binary or something because, you know, there's still a tiny sliver of uh, 
horizontal uh, space usage that they didn't manage to consume. So this is hardly an improvement, but more to the point, the default is garbage. So this is not the default. Uh, and my point is not that, you know, maybe options exist that would give us a wonderful output, but I don't care. I want the default to do something useful or the default is useless and the whole system is broken. This is the word that dominates my life that I fight all the time. And I realize that usually when you call somebody a Grinch, that it's intended as a pejorative. But come on, this is the one sensible man in Whoville who understands noise is bad. And visual noise is just as bad. And in fact, I, since I depend much more on my eyes when I'm programming than I do on my ears to actually uh, distinguish what's relevant and get it to my brain, visual noise is worse than audio noise. But and we wouldn't work on a on a tarmac at the airport. You, you know, you wouldn't invite 10 guys with jackhammers into your office to just go to town while you tried to write some piece of code. You say like, wow, that'd be really distracting. That would make it harder. And yet we basically do that with visual noise all over the place. And it's nuts. Now, I always, there are people that look at me like I'm the crazy one for thinking this is such a big deal. That they see right through the noise. Um, it's like, oh, that's you know, no big deal. I I just see right to the important thing. Now I don't like to call people liars, but I will right here because it's either you're lying or it's even worse. It's it's completely impeding you and you don't even know it. Uh, it's easy to see this in practice when you subtract certain kinds of visual noise from people's lives. They're like, wow, that's way better. Uh, but until you do that, you know, they don't care. Now, I'll, I'll concede maybe there's like some people with some kind of like crazy mutation that causes them to just be able to see what's relevant in a sea of a blizzard of noise. But I don't believe that mutation is very common. So I'm going to assume most people are like me and actually benefit from only seeing what they need to see. So here is what I propose is a much better sort of default way of thinking than, than a blizzard of noise. Quiet. Now they made a movie, and I'm going to show you that a little bit from that. Now, for reasons I don't understand at all, this movie was marketed as a horror thriller rather than an escapist fantasy like it ought to have been. Because a quiet place is what we should all aspire to spend time in. And so this, this being basically the, the dominant drive of my technical life, uh, is why I wound up working on XS, among many other things, is that I would just like to be able to work in peace without being assaulted by meaningless garbage all the time. So it's like a rat in my brain, uh, as, as uh, Phil Hartman uh, said, as I believe Troy McClure in one of the Simpsons episodes. And the other thing is that I have to be able to remember how to use it. I mean, the, the API to the uh, uh, accretion of uh, various Unix utilities for doing stuff with text is, is, is so nutty. It's basically as good as the DF output. It's like the number of things I want to do is pretty small. And, you know, there's our actually we've come up. This is where the Scala connection comes in, right? The Scala collections API is pretty good. Uh, and it's easy for me to remember how to do basic things like take the ninth through 11th uh, members of a sequence, something that is uh, 
actually rocket science for me um, if I try to remember how to use said or any of its buddies uh, to do it. So here is a, a somewhat less uh, offensive DF output. Um, uh, <laughs> Fewer uh, free inodes. Uh, I take it that I have a different number of bits in my file system or something on this machine. But this is actually chosen to be uh, a little more tractable to a series of operations. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few slides and uh, use XS to uh, turn this output into something uh, more acceptable. Now, uh, I'm well aware that there's a zillion other ways to do this sort of thing. Um, the the theme here is that uh, I would really like uh, to be able to look back at um, text processing things that I've written and know what they do and how they do it without having to remember uh, said awk, head, tail, cut, paste, uh, et cetera, syntaxes. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd, also, I know many other people have sent similar sorts of unifications. There's literally nothing new here. Um, but uh, there are many like it, but this one is mine. So, um, yeah, as we saw, df-h will take us a little distance. Okay, so here we are. Um, and a lot to unpack here, as they say. Uh, so ag-v there. Um, so here's how XS is laid out. We, it's, it's a, one command and then a bunch of arguments. And each argument is basically what would be a member of a pipeline if you were stringing everything out in pipes. Um, but I took all the stuff that comes up with any frequency in pipelines for me and uh, distilled it into something I could do as a single command to access. Um, so uh, one thing that's um, very handy here is that we have a bunch of commonly used commands. And then the arguments to that command will come after a slash. And then if there are options that you would like to give to that command, you can just um, attach them to the command itself in front. Um, so if you think of this in expanded form, it would be ag space dash v space, and then that regular expression as if it were after the pipeline of incoming standard in, um, which is not especially an improvement if that were the end of things. Um, it's really in sort of the uh, ability to compose uh, and put together uh, little clusters of these sorts of things where it becomes more useful. But also just not typing the pipe so much is actually really nice. Um, so we've used this means um, anti-grep. Uh, the, the, if it starts with map or devfs and then uh, a word boundary. In other words, remove the, the, the things that aren't disks from our output. Um, we could have uh, done the grep the other way around, but we wanted actually to keep the uh, line that labels all the columns. Um, so uh, we instead removed the worst lines, but we're not done. Okay, so here's a somewhat novel um, uh, syntax for the command line anyway, uh, which is of course directly from the Scala tuple syntax um, and super useful to me. Um, because, you know, you've got a bunch of lines with a bunch of fields in them, and rather than having to remember bizarre, uh, you know, like stringing together your little awk uh, thing, which is the, as far as I know, the standard way to do this sort of thing, um, you can just go dot and then whatever you want. Um, and you can use negative indices to go from the right side, um, rather than remembering $NF is the last doc field, for instance, um, and so on. So we've just uh, you, uh, killed all the inode blah blah fields. We took the first, second, and fifth columns and got what we wanted out of it. Uh, but we lost uh, our nice white space formatting. That's too bad, but we can do something about that. So I'm flipping it around because I want uh, the percentages on the left, that's what I want to be able to see and in particular to sort by. But also we can just throw in a line on there and it will uh, put our uh, output back into its beautiful columnar form. So now we're, um, now we're really looking at something where we might actually notice if a disk was full. Now there's a bunch of ways to sort um, that are useful and some that are really hard to get at. Something I find myself using constantly since it's in excess is sorting by the length of the lines. Um, 
I don't actually know how to do that uh, elsewhere. There, I, there, I mean, I assume there's a way to do it in like, you know, GNU sort, which has a lot of options. Um, but uh, I have, you know, it's it has not revealed itself to be in any kind of easy way. So with this particular command line, we're doing everything we were doing before, but then we are sorting uh, the numeric sort, which is to say not the lexical sort, um, on, uh, so that'll be sorting the percentages because it hits that first. And then we're reversing it, um, it rather than trying to reverse sort, we're just sorting and then reversing. And this mostly gets us what we want, except it left the uh, column headers at the bottom. Now I did that on purpose because I wanted to demonstrate the next thing, uh, which is uh, what I call promote. This is another slightly novel uh, thing. Um, promote is basically uh, partition the incoming set into the things that match the promote and the things that don't, and then just put all the promoted things in front. So um, it's like partition and then append. And then this is a, an activity that comes up for me with a lot of frequency. If I just have a big file, say, of something of uncertain levels of interest, and I want to start processing the things in that file, uh, I can often spot something that occurs in there with some frequency that would be useful to process and get rid of. And I can dredge it all up to the front of the file um, or, you know, the stream uh, and without losing anything by just promoting it. And then, you know, out it goes. I often run these uh, filters uh, inside of Sublime as pipes using a shell Turtlestein, as it's called, but basically take the output of the file I'm presently editing and run it through XS to just reorder the lines that I'm working with according to something like sort or promote. So here's the usage of promote where we just send a regular expression which will only match that one line and then this preserves the ordering of everything except the lines that matched it. So the, that single line now floats its way up to the top and the rest stays as it was. Uh, if we had some particular interest in the actual dev disk lines being ahead of the others, then we could promote those first and then promote the capacity line as we will do in the next line, like so. So in this way, we have um, sorted uh, by fullness, um, but we've promoted the disk lines ahead of the others, but each of the subsets of lines separately is sorted by fullness. And there's the slightly less annoyed Grinch. Okay, so now we'll get to the really interesting... Oh, gee, that sound we just heard means we're out of time to talk about technical things and we're going off script. Since we are officially off script, this is like uh, when the CIA agent is told that nobody can help them if they get caught. Uh, Please blame me and me alone for anything you don't like out of what you're about to hear, since I am going rogue. I want to talk about why I am speaking here and now and not at any other time or much other time in the last few years. And the reason is the terrible trends that have been taking place in the technical community and the world at large where there is a great deal of effort put into trying to police what people think. Let me tell you something. Here's some timeless wisdom. People think what they think. Oh boy, you would think that's kind of a uh, trite and obvious observation, but clearly it isn't because a lot of people seem to think that people don't think what they think. They think what they're told to think or what they are made to fear not to think. That's no way to run a world. Here we have the skills matter statement uh, about which little comment is necessary, but which was certainly my personal inspiration to volunteer to speak uh, at this conference. And going forward, you can certainly expect that if you are the sort of person who thinks they need to chase someone like John DeGoes out of a conference, Someone who works tirelessly to improve the community, to spread knowledge, to 
increase the amount of functional programming in the world. If you are going to make him your target, then people like me are going to do whatever we can to oppose you. You create enemies this way that you don't need. So stop it. Worry about yourself. Let other people be who they are. You're not in danger. You're not being chased. You live in the safest time in the history of the world. Just focus on your work. Our values dictate our actions, it says. That's not true. Your cowardice dictates your actions. Companies are cowardly. And as long as they're more afraid of the kind of people that got John deplatformed than they are of the rest of us, they will keep acting this way. This must end. That's how I feel about this. I thought I could get it down to three letters, and I did. And I found some footage of the kind of people that got John deplatformed. You're not walking out on this one, mister. You're finished. No more Delta. You bought it this time, Buster. I'm calling your national office. I'm going to revoke your charter. And if you wise guys try one more thing, one more, I'm going to kick you out of this college. No more fun of any kind. Okay. So I'm not going to lie to you. I have this footage that my daughters and I captured uh, that's just too incredible not to share. And so I was determined to find a reason to shoehorn it into this talk since it's the first opportunity I've had in the over a year since I've collected it to use it anywhere. So it's a metaphor. Now, the participants in this little drama are a, uh, a ground beetle larva a house centipede, and a spider of indeterminate species. Um, and now let's see what happens when all of these fellows are trapped under the same glass. Now, the metaphor is that the spider and the ground beetle larva are activist groups of some kind determined to consume some innocent house centipede who just wants to talk about functional programming. Eventually, they finish the house centipede, and then there they are staring at each other. Does it end like this? No, it does not. One of them's going to eat the other because you never stop eating. Unless you can find a way to live with the house centipede in peaceful harmony by not trying to deplatform it from the centipede conference. But speeches are for campaigning. Now is the time for action.